Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Today's sermon by Dr. Bill Waddell is in Luke chapter 9. Who is this Jesus? Luke chapter 9. We're working our way through the New Testament, or I should say through the book of Luke, and uh, finding ourselves here last week looking at the feeding of the 5,000, which actually, if you were here with us, you know that actually 20,000. 5,000 is just a, uh, a number that they're expecting you to multiply times three, at least, maybe four. Uh, depending on, you know, circumstances. But uh, that, that story, and then we have here Luke fast-forwarding straight to a very decisive, so you have a very decisive miracle. Um, largest quantitative miracle that Jesus produces on this earth when he is uh, in his three-year ministry. So feeding 20,000, I mean, you have 20,000 people experiencing all the same miracle at the same time. That's quantitatively the largest miracle he does. Uh, qualitative is, of course, that's uh, everybody's, on opinion, but quantitatively, definitely without question. And so Luke just fast forwards straight to this so the very decisive event, which is Jesus' greatest quantitative miracle. He goes right to the, deci- the, the decisive thing, which of course, now what are you going to say about it? Let's watch and see what happens here. Luke chapter 9, verse 18. It came about while he was praying alone. The disciples were with him and he questioned them saying, who do the multitudes say that I am? Now, what's the Notice, notice the answer. What's the first answer? Now, that's nuts. John's been dead for a year, at least, at this point. So how can this be John? Well, because, Pastor, don't you know people believe in the resurrection? Yeah, they do, but that's not the issue here. Is what, is what they're failing to believe is the issue here. Not, not okay, so, and, and it gets crazier than that. Maybe John the Baptist. Others say Elijah has been dead for 600 years or more. And then others, one of the prophets, of course, they're referring to the writers of the Old Testament, of course, have been, guys have been dead for anywhere a thousand years or something, in some cases or more. So, but, but what they're not coming up with, the, I, I guess we could say not everybody, but, but the average answer out there, which is John the Baptist, is of course not the right answer, which is Jesus is the Messiah, he's the king, he's God's son. And, and, and what I'm opposing to you up, up front, very, 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 uh, with a lot of concern and, and worry is Why? So what more does he need to do? I mean, we like need more evidence here? Apparently they did. And I will say to you at this point, with all the evidence that they have, there's not enough evidence in the universe for them to believe. Because unbelief, guys, listen to me, is a decision. It's not a lack of evidence. It's a decision despite the evidence or in favor of the evidence, depending on what the case may be. So notice Jesus goes straight to the next question, which is the most important one. It's the question we're all going to answer, whether you like it or not. You'll either answer it by reality or answer it by default. But who do you say that I am? Peter, we know under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, answers this way, the Christ of God. Is that the way you would have answered? Well, yeah, because I read the New Testament. Yeah, but would you have answered that way? I think I would have more likely said, my Savior. It's not a wrong answer, is it? My Christ, my Messiah. Why does he say Christ of God under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? I'm just pose that to you. We're going to get to it. And he warned them, instructed them not to tell this to anyone. Wow. I sense some judgment in that. I sense an issue in that. And he brings it up here. The Son of Man, he says, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, be raised on the third day, of course, didn't, which didn't fit into the typical theology of the day. And so, so you have this, this confrontational issue because they've been brought to this spot. Uh, this culmination of Jesus' Galilean ministry, of course, is the feeding of the 5,000. So, so Luke just fast forwards through the next month. The other gospel writers give us, fill in what happens between the feeding of the 5,000 and the time here at a place called Caesarea Philippi, up in the north part there. And, 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 but Luke just fast forwards. I mean, so far, he, he, we've given in Luke, Luke is just pushing us to, to, to answer the question, to deal with the issues. To take the evidence and shake it down and come to a conclusion because truly uh, that's where he is. And we've seen in Luke all these testimonies. You have the testimony of Gabriel who comes to Mary and says, the one that's going to be conceived in you is going to be called the Son of God. And you have, of course, Zacharias, the father of of, uh, John the Baptist, who says the same thing. Anna and Simeon, prophet, prophetess, say the same thing. You have Jesus at his baptism. A voice from heaven, for, or no less, with a, uh, the Holy Spirit descending in an image looking like a dove. Everybody can see this. Everybody can hear the voice. Behold, my son, right, with whom I'm well pleased. 
So they don't know who Jesus is at this point. I mean, you've got all this testimony. And if we lack testimony, you've got that of Satan, who three different times says, since you are the Son of God, you know, do this, turn the bread into, you know, stone into bread, etc., jump off the Temple Mount. Uh, and, and then you have the demons, every time Jesus deals with them, pretty much, they're, they're shouting something to the effect of, we know who you are, the Holy One of God. So you have all these testimonies. So all the testimonies in is what Luke's saying at this point. He just fast forwards to the conclusion. All the testimonies in, all the miracles are done. And the largest quantitative miracle, 20,000 people see it. It's not something, oh, well, you had to be there to, to know. No, everybody knows it. They, are, they were there. They, they saw it. And, and so he pushes to this final and ultimate questions. And ultimately, no one can answer those questions for you. The question has, you will answer that question, though. Every one of us will. Your pastor can't answer it for you. Your church denomination can't answer it for you. Your mom can't answer it for you. Your friends can't answer it for you. You have to answer the question, who do you say that Jesus is? And I warn you, heaven and hell hang in the balance of what that question is. past fail. Heaven and hell. Just the way it is. It's interesting, this question is un, it's an un, unavoidable question, but it's interesting, the people here, they, they never question Jesus' miracles. That's what people do anymore. Everybody questions Jesus' miracles. Oh, well, we're not sure. It could have been this. It could have been, I don't know, stardust. It could have been, you know, sun caught their eyes and they just saw it this way and there was some kind of anomaly. I was watching a thing the other day. I was, they were trying to find out some kind of earthquake that maybe parted the, the Red Sea. It wasn't actually a miracle. It was just some kind of, you know, natural, natural event. Guys, listen, if it says it's a miracle, that's what it is. You're going to take, it, it's, it's asinine to take natural things and try to explain the supernatural. You're already denying that it's not supernatural. So you're not going to come to the right conclusions. The Bible's laying out as, as supernatural. There, take it or leave it. But it's interesting, it, no one in Jesus' day, and, and by the way, the same people who kill him never question his miracles. Never. Not one time do they take issue with that. Well, you didn't really do that. He didn't really accomplish that. They never question his miracles. In fact, at one point, they're about to stone him. And he says, okay, for which one of my miracles do you stone me? Now, right there, they, if they would have said, oh, well, you didn't really do this, they would have said it right there. They're, gonna kill, they're willing to kill him, but they're unwilling to question his miracles. I find that very interesting because they, it's the opposite. It's like, well, we would never kill Jesus, but we were questioning all of his miracles. It's like, yeah, I don't think there's any difference in us today. They were, they were not skeptical at all. And one of the reasons this is because about every other person was a person who had been, received a miracle. If he hadn't fed them, He's healed them. If he hadn't healed them, he's delivered them. If he hadn't delivered them, he's raised them from the dead. I mean, you bring up any, you question even one time, oh, I don't really think he did that. Well, you've got somebody within earshot probably who's been affected by a miracle of Jesus in Jerusalem, I mean, in Israel by this time. Thousands of people. He, score, really, he scores of people. Again, the New Testament just gives us the highlights of what he does. But several places it says he healed people all day long. Everyone that came near him, every single disease, every person with demon possession, every one of them, they're everywhere. He performed them publicly. He did them to the tune of almost 20,000 witnesses at one time. No one questioned his miracles. And so what you have in front of you here is you have an ultimatum. You have a, you have a question that has to be answered. Evidence demands a verdict, doesn't it? And it does. It's where we are. We have all the testimony in. We have all the miracles in. So John, Luke brings us right straight to the point. So what's your answer? Who do you say that he is? It's a question that's unavoidable. It's also a question that has a time limit. How long do you think a person's got to decide about Jesus? For sure when they're dead, right? Can we say that? Okay. That's what I always say. Well, and as long as they're alive, you know, there's a chance. And, and because I don't know. I don't know, but I do know this. To say that it's only when you die is inaccurate. It's, it's biblically inaccurate, actually. There's actually, at least in some cases, as the case we're going to see in just a second, sometimes the time limit is up long before you die. The crowd that Jesus ministers to and he serves here in the area of Galilee, actually their time limit was up at the feeding of the 5,000. That was their decision. Whatever they did with Jesus from that point on was their final decision. Because God basically pulls back the option from that point on, doesn't give them any more options. I mean, it's, it's very interesting. So he feeds the 5,000, and then Jesus basically secludes himself from this time on. From, every, from, from this point on, most of what you hear Jesus doing is ministering just to his disciples. 
And by the way, mostly in Gentile territory. He goes from Caesarea Philippi is where, where Peter makes this confession. That's up in the north. That's Gentile area. He's excluded himself from the Jews. And prior to that, it tells us a month before, he's over in Sidon uh, healing uh, the daughter of a Syrophoenician woman of, of demon possession. She's also Gentile. She's in a Gentile region. Why isn't he with the Jews anymore? Because he's rendered a judgment against them. This is now it. They've had their shot. And they're not dead yet. So it's instructive. It's, it's sobering, I think. And, and we see it more clearly here if... if You'll take a look here on the screen. This is, this is John chapter 12, by the way. This is probably, I don't know, six, eight, maybe ten months before his crucifixion. So, so he's done all these miracles. You've got people just swarming the streets that have used to have one leg or no eyes that worked or couldn't hear their whole life or demon-possessed or controlled. I mean, you've got all these different people. Lives have been changed completely. You've got miracles walking everywhere. And yet, notice the response of the crowd when Jesus starts instructing about who the Messiah really, really is. The crowd then answered him, we have heard from the law that the Christ has remained forever. So they're differing with him right there. How is it that you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? And notice the, the, the question, who is this Son of Man? Now, I'm okay with that question at his, at his, at his baptism, but, but you have almost three years here with him in all of his miracles. And all the testimonies, it's very instructive here. And one of the things that we need to learn very clearly on this is that miracles don't save anybody. They help you in the short term. They don't necessarily help you in the long term. The only thing that saves people is belief. You have to believe it or not. But a miracle doesn't do anything for you. A miracle doesn't save anybody. It didn't save those people. They saw them all. Wouldn't you like to have been there to see that? Scratch your head and say, how couldn't they believe that? Well, I don't know exactly, but I'm telling you, they didn't. Their conclusion was he must be John the Baptist, he must be some Elijah, I don't know. How can they not know? How can they not have the answer to that question already? But they don't. And there's a reason for it. And it's a judicial reason. Because they have had plenty of chances to make that decision, but they would not. And now they've reached the place, and here's important to understand this, now they've reached a place where they could not. You're going to be determined not to decide about Jesus, or you're going to reach a place where you can't decide about Jesus. God would never do that. Yeah, he does it with them. He certainly does. Notice, keep going here. Jesus' advice to them, while you have the light, believe in the light. While the light's on, make your decisions, because when the light goes out, option time is over, that you may become the sons of light. Notice, these things Jesus proclaimed, and then went away and hid himself from them. It's over. Option period, it's over. Time he's going to minister to them publicly, it's over. In fact, Jesus there in, in Luke, in Luke chapter, chapter 11, just, just two chapters away, begins to pronounce judgments. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Woe to you, Capernaum. We saw part of that last week. Woe to you, Chorazin. Because if the miracles have been done on you, have been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, he says. They would have repented. But the judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah, he says, is going to be less than on you because you saw all these things and yet you, came to, you can't still answer the question, which is the answer to the question. Though he had performed so many signs in their sight, they still were not believing him. 39 and 40, for this reason, notice, they could not believe. There's a difference between would not and could not, right? Would not means the ball's in your court. And I can serve it back however I want to. Could not means I have no more options. See the difference? So there's something judicial that's taking place here. For this reason, they could not believe because as, I, as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes, hardened their hearts. Why? Because they would not. Because they would not. So that they neither, now they cannot. They can't see. Neither with their eyes nor nor understand with their hearts, nor turn, he says, or else I would heal them. But now the judgment has fallen upon them. Their ability to answer the question has a time limit on it. They would not, and now they cannot. It's over. It's sad. It's sobering. It's judicial. It's the judgment of God. They, they wouldn't, and it eventually meant that they couldn't. And that's the way it works. 
You harden your heart against God long enough, and then judicially God will harden your heart. You can't unravel that. You can't undo that. They went, why couldn't they apprehend who Jesus is? Why couldn't they catch with all the evidence, with all the testimony? Because they didn't want to. Reminds me of a story of a guy I was reading. He was talking about raised on a farm. And his brother's, he and his brother's responsibility was to catch chickens because mom would, you know, kill them and they would eat them that night. So every day they had to go out and ch catch chickens. He says, I almost never caught a chicken. My whole, my whole career as a child with my job that I had to catch chickens. He says, the reason why I didn't catch chicken is because well, I didn't want to. They're nasty birds. You got to run them out of the outhouse, right? What are they eating in there? They, they fight and kill each other, right? And then eat each other. You know, chickens are, are yard buzzards, really are. And he says, I just didn't like them. I had a little cone on their head and he stuff. He says, but I didn't disobey my mom the way she thought I was. And he says, I was a great faker at trying to catch a chicken. I could come so close. I could look so serious and so frustrated that I couldn't catch that chicken. But the bottom line is I didn't catch chickens because I didn't want to catch chickens. Why can't they catch who Jesus is? Because they don't want to. They just don't want to. They don't like it. Jesus is not jumping through the hoops that they want him to jump through, and so they don't like that. So they're going to teach him a lesson. Even with so much evidence, so much influence, they, they couldn't come up with the right answer. Jesus, I mean, you can imagine someone with more influence than Jesus. He healed almost every other person. Delivered, fed. Almost every other person in a three-year ministry, in all of Israel. So much influence, and yet so many who wound up this way, judicially, because they would not. How is it that they would not? With so much influence, there's a myth that the churches believe today, and it's a myth of influence, and here's how it goes. We think something along these lines. If such and such prominent person came to Christ, then can you imagine the type of influence that they could have as if if we could get more of the right people saved then more other people would get saved as opposed to the current system what we have if we get you know just getting the regular people saved i don't know y'all are just have you know it just weakens the church because we're getting all these regular people saved so they don't have any money or influence they don't have a big name it's a myth guys listen influence is a myth but here's how I know it. Because tell me who had more influence than Jesus. Who could? Who could? So I get an athlete saved, which I hope they do, by the way. And yeah, if they get saved and they give a testimony to Jesus, that's awesome. And that is definitely their responsibility, as it is all of ours. You understand their influence is not going to change hearts of people. Because the influence of Jesus didn't change the hearts of a large number of people. And you can't get more influential than Jesus. He's, every other person's life has been changed by him in the short term. And yet they're not apprehending who he is. Why? Because influence is a myth. It definitely is a myth. And, and yet we bought into this myth in our churches because we, 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 we focus we harder, listen, on where our church is and what color it is and what our preacher looks like and what his degrees are than on actually preaching the gospel. Because we believe that that stuff is more important than actually the gospel is. Like that's going to get people more, more people are going to be saved is, you know, if, I don't know, the color and the position of the church and, and uh, the fact that we're on television and the fact that, I don't know, our pastor gets hair plugs. But don't ask me to do that because I'm not going to do it. <laughs> this is my whole sermon against that. <laughs> Guys, listen, nobody ever got saved by influence. He can be more influential than Jesus. The ministry of the church is not influence. The ministry of the church is the gospel. The power of the church is the gospel. And they will either take it or they will leave it. They will either take it or they will leave it. That is the power of the church, not influence. You don't get real conversions from influence, just like Jesus had. A lot of people follow him. You think, all these people are trusting Jesus. Yeah, they are, until Jesus didn't do what he wanted them to do. And then they crucified him. They shouted him down, the same people. He's been ministering to them. You got, where do they come up with this whole crowd of people that say crucify him? It's the same people he's been ministering to all these years. They've seen all these miracles. But because Jesus didn't fit in their box. So you're doing all these miracles, Jesus, isn't that awesome? But I got a box called the Messiah. And you're not fitting in that. So uh -uh. 
Sorry. And you wonder today, because you have people who fuss over the scriptures and who fuss over the identity of Jesus, and you all, I just want to ask the question, can they not read English? Or Spanish? Or whatever Bible they're reading? Because it's right there. I mean, I, I always say, say you don't believe it, that's okay. But don't say we're just not really sure who Jesus is. How can you not be sure what the Bible says? I got a, one, I got a first grader in my Sunday school class who've accepted Jesus as a personal Savior. She can tell you who Jesus is, but I got a guy with all kinds of letters after his name who just simply can't come up with the answer. Why is that? It tells us here, they, he cannot because he would not. It's just the way it is. It's a question with a time limit. It's a question that ultimately has to be answered by God first. In fact, if we come at it from the wrong way, we'll come up with the wrong answer. Somehow you think Jesus is, the whole world revolves around you, which is the world we live in. That's the part of the problem with the, with, the, with the people of this day. It was there. We have a Messiah. He's coming for us. Like I said, this box that he's supposed to fit in. And if he doesn't fit, well, then we don't believe in him. They're trying to tell Jesus how it actually reads in, in, the, in their Bible. It's like, Jesus, listen, is, is the whole emphasis of the Bible. But you're not listening to him. He's demonstrated who he is, but you're, you're not following him. You're not paying attention to him. It's, it's interesting, like I said, we have to come at it first understanding this, that Jesus was God's Christ first, before he can ever be your Christ. Take a look. I mean, notice, under influence of the Holy Spirit, how does Peter answer the question? Don't mistake Peter for a smart guy. This is the Holy Spirit. In fact, Jesus says, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you in another place, right? but only by means of the Holy Spirit? Peter gives a great answer here. It's encouraging. That's great because somebody like Peter can come up with the right thing, well, then there's hope for all of us. We can come up with the right answer. Who knows, you know. The Christ of God. I would submit to you that's an unusual answer. It's an unusual answer because it's not self-centered. Because that's our tendency. Well, when you say, who is Jesus? And you're immediately going to tell me, most of us will, and I will too, who Jesus is to me. He's my Savior. And that's not a wrong statement. It's not inaccurate. But, but the, the important here, why does the Holy Spirit inspire him to say it this way? The order is very important here. He can't really be your Savior until you understand that, or you're Christ, until you understand he's God's Christ first. He's God's Christ first. It's first about God before it's ever about you. It's important you come to that conclusion. So, so uh, we saw earlier in our study, months back, uh, John the Baptist is uh, baptizes Jesus, and a day later, Jesus is walking by, and he turns to his disciples. John does this, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. The Lamb of God? I thought he was our Lamb. Well, yeah, he is. First, he's God's, though. First, he's God's. The Messiah of God, that's what Peter says here. It's the same word there, Christ, Messiah. They mean the same thing. He, he's God's lands first and foremost. We only, listen, we see only what Jesus does for us and not so much what he does for God. Before we were ever here and sin was ever an issue, he was God's Christ. In fact, the scripture tells us before the foundation of the world, Jesus was slain. So before there's ever a devil and ever sin and ever a garden of Eden where two people messed up, the plan was always God's Christ. He's God's. He's dealing with God's issues to say, well, God doesn't need to be rescued from anything. Oh, yes, he does. See, see in, in, our, in our contemplation of sin, in our uh, condition and the consequences that are coming for us, which are certainly uh, worth our time spending on, we forget, listen, we become so self-focused that we miss the tear in the eyes of the one who's judging us and what he knows he's going to have to do. So knowing what he would have to do based upon what we would do, he decided before all eternity what he was going to do first. He was going to have a Savior that would first rescue him from what he would have to do, then rescue us. The order is very important here. It's very important we understand that God decides who Jesus is, not us. It's not for us to come to the table and say, well, we're going to work this out. You hear people all say all the time, I'm going to make a deal when I get the man upstairs. He and I are going to work out a deal. Listen, there's not going to be a deal worked out. The man upstairs has got a deal from all eternity, and it's take it or leave it. Yes or no. Heaven or hell. Hang in the balance of that deal. 
God is making every effort to, to deliver himself from what he knows he has to do, destroying sin without destroying the sinner. And so that's exactly what he planned to, for Jesus to be for us. Exactly. He's God's Christ first. He's God's Christ. You think about it, the people consistently were disillusioned with Jesus, weren't they? As time went by, even more so. Even after all the miracles that he does, you know, all these amazing things, how can you be disillusioned with this guy? What's not to love about him? Because like I said, they had a box called Messiah, had a box called Christ, and he just simply wouldn't fit in it. Because since the world revolves around us, we get to decide who our Messiah is, and no, you don't. He, 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 they had decided what their Messiah was going to be like, but Jesus came, listen, not to do our bidding. He came to do God's bidding. The good news is, is that in doing God's bidding, we get the thing we want which is to be forgiven of our sins and be made right with God. God decided that, though. Listen, that was his decision. But he's delivered himself first from, from what he has to do because he loves us, because he does. And that's the whole reason, by the way, why Jesus tells his disciples, don't tell anybody. Why? Because they're, they're box, listen, of what the Messiah was. They're going to come to the wrong conclusion. You can't even tell these people who he is now. And again, part of that largely is judicial. But everybody then and everybody today has their whole idea of who Jesus is supposed to be. They have all kinds of definitions of Jesus. Now, Jesus is still extremely popular. He was just as popular back then, maybe more popular today. Everybody has their version of Jesus that they like. We all come up with our own Jesuses because, again, we're, we're, we're self-focused, not God-focused. We're not trying to hear it from heaven. We're trying to hear it from ourselves and then oppose on heaven, impose on heaven who Jesus is supposed to be. He's supposed to fit in this box, God. No, he doesn't. There, there's uh, lots of Jesuses out there. There's the Republican Jesus. Do you know him? He's against Wall Street and apparently against oil. And he's in favor of reducing a carbon footprint, and he's in favor of printing money, too, it seems, seems to be. But then, of course, there's a Republican Jesus. There's also a Democrat Jesus. Yeah, that's, that, I'm sorry, that's, that's the Democrat Jesus. The Republican Jesus is like this. He's against tax increases, which so am I. And he's, of course, against the current administration, and he's in favor of family values and, of course, owning firearms. That's the Republican Jesus. I'm, I got those mixed up. And there, there's the Starbucks Jesus. Have you ever met him? He drinks fair trade coffee and he loves spiritual conversations. And, of course, he drives a hybrid and goes to film festivals. Everybody has their version of Jesus. Love that Jesus, don't you? And there's the open-minded Jesus who loves everyone all the time, no matter what, except, of course, if you're not as open-minded, you know, as he is. And then, of course, we just got all football season, right? There we just, there's the touchdown Jesus who helps the Christian athletes run faster and more, score more points, and he changes the outcomes of Super Bowls, at least sometimes. Right? Everybody loves that Jesus. And then there's, of course, the gentle Jesus who is meek and mild and has high cheekbones and fair skin and flowing hair and walks around barefoot and wears a sash and carries a lamb. Right? <laughs> There's a yuppie Jesus. I like this one too. He encourages us to teach, to reach our full potential, to, to reach for the stars, and to, of course, buy a car and, and a boat. <laughs> but, but what about the real Jesus? Everybody's got their version. Real Jesus is none of these things. He's none of these things. He's not what we would impose on heaven. He's God's Christ. He, he's take it, take it or leave it. He's God's. From all eternity. He's been God's. He's not a reflection of our current mood or projection of our own desires. He never was, never will be. Take him or leave him. He's the Lord God, though. He's the Father's Son, the Savior of the world, the substitute for sins. He's more loving, more holy, more wonderfully terrifying than we could possibly ever imagine. That's who he is. So you have to decide. Who do you say? That he is. Is he God's Christ? Or is he yours? Be who you want. But you have to make a decision. I'm going to ask if you would bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we talk a little bit more here and then pray together. He's God's Christ. He can't be yours until he's first God's. He can't be really yours until you understand that heaven is imposing this on us. 
We don't have a vote in this. He's not up for election. He's not what we want him to be. He is who he is. We have to decide. Believe it or not. Take it or leave it. Walk in or walk out. Lord, I pray that we would humble ourselves to you, to your plan, to your way. It's sobering to think of how how miraculous your ministry was and how powerful the testimony was. And yet so many failed to comprehend it, failed to apprehend who you were. They, they would not. And then as your judgment, Lord, they could not. Lord, I pray for the person who's just simply on the fence, somehow thinking they've got plenty of time and that the Jesus question is a question they can answer in their own way, in their own time. And God, I pray that they would get off that fence. They would know by just simply not answering, they're giving an answer. God, I thank you for coming to us, not bowing to us. But I pray that we would bow to you. Thank you for speaking to us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.